All right. Good morning, everybody. We are going to start shortly. Good morning. Just admitting all of you here and oh, happy to have you all here with us this morning. We will begin shortly. We are going to be doing a presentation with Nasiha this morning, and we have Sumaya Puna with us this morning that will introduce Nasiha and what they're all about before we do a presentation with Tarek Ahmed. He's an expert and we will start soon. Just let me give, give it another minute or two and we will begin. Okay. Thank you for joining us. It's a beautiful morning here. Hope it is at your end as well. Right. We will begin in any second with our introduction to Nasiha and all the wonderful things that they do. And we have Sumaya today joining us from Toronto, Canada, who will introduce Nasiha to us. So Sumaya, thank you for joining us. I'm really happy that you're here with us this morning. And I'm so glad I was able to have the opportunity to meet with you when you were in Michigan presenting uh, Nasiha to us, which is where I learned of the wonderful work they do. And I am going to let Sumaya tell you about what they do and also to introduce herself and how she got this going. So this is, this is just wonderful. Thank you, uh, Sumaya, for joining us this morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this informative session. Um, my name is Maya Puna. I head operations at Nasiha. Uh, I helped to establish the organization. I founded the education and outreach department of the organization. Um, in addition to the helpline, the education and outreach was an avenue of support for caregivers and families uh, supporting the youth because what we found was a lot of the advice or voices being amplified from the Muslim community were sort of in conflict or contradiction to the evidence that we were seeing um, compiled through the helpline platforms. So what we did was we established um, like, you know, workshops and seminars at the local community centers around how to equip your children um, with the information that they needed to sort of navigate their journeys through life. Uh, and we started to get um, different requests from organizations like hospitals. We're now working with a lot of the public school boards here in Ontario, Canada and trying, we, we are also a registered charity in the US. So doing more outreach into the US, uh, we receive roughly four to 600 calls a month um, and about a hundred text conversations. We also have um, assisted 147 clients in accessing free web therapy with registered clinicians here again in Ontario. Um, some of the um, registrants have been with us for a few years now, um, and we've never, we don't want cost to be a, a barrier of access uh, for our community. I don't know if Tarek has joined us yet. I think he will be soon, shortly. We have an expert today that will be uh, presenting and fielding some excellent, important questions that we have for him today. Um, so thank you for that introduction. You know, um, I, I mean, I just want to give you a little bit of an introduction as well as to the fact that I, I've heard that the helpline has been, you know, I was just telling her a lifeline for many. So this has yes. been a wonderful uh, uh, organization that is now uh, do doing outreach in the United States as well as Canada. And just to give you a little introduction, you know, uh, Nasiha does provide non-judgmental -jud and anonymous support for all those experiencing these personal challenges. And as we know, our refugee youth also experience personal challenges, which is why I thought Nas Nasiha would be a great organization for us to hear from. So I'm really uh, happy they're here with us today. Uh, and we'll, we'll have Tarek Ahmed 
I'll introduce him as well. I'm, I think he's going to be joining us shortly. Uh, I'll introduce uh, him a little bit so that you all know what he has and, uh, for store for us. So Tarek ha has a master's of social work uh, from the University of Toronto and a bachelor's as well from Ryerson University, two prominent universities in Toronto, Canada. He has had um, several years experience, you know, providing services to related to mental health, um, crisis intervention, suicide, substance abuse, addictions, clinical treatment, rehab, and also supportive, other supportive services. So he's really right up there with uh, providing uh, all these services. And he is a, a compassionate person. He's client focused and a social worker who applies his knowledge to human behavior. So I'm really excited that he's going to be on board with us. I think he's just running a little bit late and he'll be with us shortly. So this is this is just great to be able to um, hear from him and, and, and learn about some of the, the challenges that we can uh, hear about and also apply to our, um, you know, to, to our own audience and who what we are facing with in our lives. So this, is, this has been wonderful. So I think uh, anything else about Tarek, we should uh, know, Samaya, feel free to um, share um, as yeah, we please. wait for him to join us. Sure, Tark is our clinical supervisor, ah. um, and he oversees all of the clinical activities at the organization. Um, I mean, if you guys have any questions, we, we can also wait for mm -hmm. Tark as well, but I can mm -hmm. comment uh, just based on what we've been able to kind of see through our helpline as well. Right. Do you have, uh, Sumaya, mainly that, you know, we're dealing with refugee youth. Uh, yeah. So what is, what are, do, I, I believe that Nasiha's main thing is youth, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I would say our top three issues post-pandemic mm -hmm. is around a lot of financial insecurity, whether it's housing, whether it's food insecurity. Mm -hmm. um, and prior to the pandemic, it was not even, you know, in our top 10 uh, mm -hmm. highest ranking issues. And then beyond that, um, a lot of uh, interpersonal relationships, whether that's with a parent or caregiver or a sibling or relationships at school, uh, that's a big one. And then um, whether it's stress, anxiety, substance abuse, um, we also see a lot of like just this past year, I would say, an increase in suicidal ideation, so much so that we've uh, trained our entire team to be ASSIST certified, um, which is a great training uh, that I would highly recommend for everybody. You don't have to be, um, you know, in have a professional background in mental health to be ASSIST certified uh, and it could really save the life of anyone we I know our counselors are using the tools and strategies uh, through the assist certification every single day right right and if you can just um, um, let us know what the helpline number is again so that yes, we are absolutely. all very much you'd love to be aware of it I've mentioned it too but it's great to just uh, remind us yeah, the phone number is 1-866-627-3342. And it's is that, is that, is that a, a name? Is it Nasiha? It is, it is Nasiha. Yeah, okay. I can okay. respond to the question in the, uh, the, you would have to get an assist certified trainer or two trainers to come maybe do uh, training at, do you guys have an office? Yeah, uh, it is a it, there is a bit of a cost uh, to run the session, but I it's through an organization called Living Works, and I believe they're based in uh, the U.S. as well. That's excellent. That's yeah. excellent. Uh, are you are you finding you are getting a lot of calls or, or starting to from the U.S.? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we I would say since. It, the actually Trump, when Trump was elected to pres, become president, that was when we saw a surge in our calls from the US. Uh, and since then, we've roughly received about 50% of our calls from the US. 
Excellent. Well, what are some of the states you've expanded to, just so we know? Yeah, uh, we we get calls from California. Mm-hmm. We get calls from New Mexico. Uh, we get calls all across the country, Boston, mm-hmm. um, New York, quite a right. few. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's excellent. That's wonderful to hear that. Um, I know that, uh, you know, for refugee youth, we're facing specific issues. And if anybody um, would like before Tarek, sorry, Tar- I believe Tarek is a bit delayed, right? He is going to join us pretty it soon. It looks like it, yeah. Yeah, so we are, yeah, so we're, while we wait for him, if anybody has any specific uh, scenarios that you're facing or issues that you're facing, I would um, love for us to get that out there in a comment or in a question so we could help. But I know that before I fielded some questions as well, from some of you, and I and mm-hmm. I did get, uh, I get I did get some of those questions, and we can ask uh, Tarek Ahmed these questions when he when he joins us. But I, I know I know that especially for refugee youth, we are facing some very different barriers like languages and communication, yeah. uh, culture culture shock, um, you know, navigating through our ed- a, a, a foreign education system. So you know, as as our as our youth face these, um, you know, we seek some professional assistance and advice and uh, and hopefully we can you know ask some of these questions and have Tarek uh, present to us about these so I know last time that Sonia had done a great job of uh, presenting and addressing some of these questions as well so you know even I mean it comes down to even basic things like some of our youth facing culture shock in in terms of food right so and and then that can do something to the psyche so all of us are here as uh, you know my uh, in this, uh, as experts as too, we, you know, our agencies, the staff that are dealing with it, they're doing such great jobs uh, and are here to learn and address those. And, uh, you know, you, you become part of that uh, uh, organization that we reach out to as well. The landscape. So yeah. we've actually been working with the YMCA mm-hmm. out of St. John, uh, Halifax, I believe St. John's, and then New Brunswick. We've also had some experience working with the newcomer population as well. There have been a few suicides uh, reported, and unfortunately, you know that leaves some of sometimes there's wives uh, or children um, as well, but you know, the work that we have been actively involved in is around creating a sense of safety and belonging as they sort of integrate into uh, North America because, you know, really they're going through, they're coming to the table with so much uh, yes. that it's, it's hard to adapt quickly as resilient as they've been to this point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think for a lot of individuals too this is the first time they're feeling a sense of safety and that can feel different right than what they've been accustomed to as well so it takes time Uh, I was just recently over at a friend's house this past weekend and she adopted five children from Morocco and her her youngest a group of twins, I think there are about five, were refused access to public education because the school system felt like they, you know, were not safe enough mm-hmm. to kind of enter into the school system. I know one, like there was uh, some violent incidences. Um, they were both flight risks. And so, you know, who is supposed to be like, taking on that onus of responsibility it's Mm -hmm. really quite challenging for a lot of the adults involved in this system Uh, and so if we can kind of work together and have and layer our um, community interventions I Mm -hmm. think would have better outcomes right right yeah I can I can see that I mean, for our for a lot of our refugee youth too, they're facing you know the the, uh, the distance from their families of as course. they're here or waiting to rejoin their families. Um, uh, the the lack of you know regular communication and being able to see them that can be part of some of the stressors and trauma that they face. And uh, 
you know, and for some of them, sadly, you know, the fact that they may be the uh, only uh, or few survivors of their own family, yeah. you know, so, so that, that survivor guilt that you sometimes feel as well that um, I noticed right. in some of our youth. So these are some uh, areas that um, I feel like Masiha can really um, address and, and possibly, you know, help us with in terms of knowing, well, what are some skills um, that we can used to reach out so, to these youth we've we've also done uh group circles as well mm -hmm. with newcomer youth yeah. and it really is just a forum for open discussion mm -hmm. for our young people to kind of talk about some of the challenges they're facing right like uh -huh. Um, in this sort of process and some of the things that were brought up were things like missing their home right and and not realizing that you know when they kind of looked over their shoulder that was the last time they saw their ancestral home and they'll never see it again right or the fact yeah. that maybe it's it's inhabited by someone else now um, yes. I, I remember another youth mentioning that she felt an immense sense of guilt because mm -hmm. everybody back home feels like you got out right and mm -hmm. you should have this beautiful life right now but she's like it's actually really hard here mm -hmm. right it's, and and they're thinking they're all looking at her like she was the lucky one that got out but that doesn't really acknowledge the work involved in yes. building a new life as well. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah, there's so many layers to this, isn't there? It's, uh, it's it certainly presents uh, many challenges, of, of course. Um, I'd, um, I'd love to hear um, mm -hmm. what other people are experiencing in their work, in their agencies, and yeah. some of their programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, if you uh, are open to sharing, uh, you know, while we wait uh, for Tarek Ahmed to join us, uh, apologies that he's running a bit behind yeah. this morning and something had come up, but I'm sure he will join us soon. So if you'd like to share any uh, comments or field any questions with our, uh, you know, Samaya herself is an expert, uh, we can certainly, you know, uh, address that while we uh, wait for, for Tarek to join us. Um, there are so many layers to, of course, what you're all facing as well and what you're all doing in, in a different capacity. You know, we have foster parents here as well here that have youth with them that are uh, facing many challenges as they incorporate them as part of their family. So, um, yeah, please, if you um, feel open to sharing and, and asking any questions that you might have, uh, go ahead and put it out in the chat. Um, or unmute yourself and ask as well. Either is fine. Yeah. I'll raise your hand if you're doing this. I'm trying to see if there's anything on the chat. In there. So, like I said, Sumaya, there's a lot of different things that we um, that foster parents face when they have a youth you know, come on board in their family. And uh, one of the things that I'm sure they're dealing with is also the, you know, the different systems that we have in place in our life, in our family to make, get, allow them to adjust, you know, and it comes from like, I'm sure everything, you know, even down to the basics of, um, you know, clothing, you know, to adjust to different clothing, um, to adjust to eating in a certain way, or maybe even I, I remember sp uh, talking to a youth to even the time, the time that we eat, right? The time that we eat here and the time that they had dinner um, possibly in their homes. So even that can be become a form of um, stressor as they adjust. Um, so there's been, there's been a lot of different, uh, and I'm sure that parents uh, who have these youth with us have, have been dealing with some of this and you know, going to school, um, the timings of school, adjusting to and acclimating to American life and American uh, culture while trying to retain um, their own identity, which can be difficult. Absolutely. I yeah. think that what we found, again, through that circle that we did mm -hmm. uh, with the newcomer youth was they really valued that sense of community because mm -hmm. they're coming from a collectivist uh, environment where yeah. you would always have the house 
filled with visitors uh, and they miss that sort of sense of community. I think growing up here in North America, we don't have that same level of exposure to people always being in our house, always stopping in for tea or dropping something over. But that's really what they are longing for, um, to sort of feel welcomed uh, and embraced. Uh, and if they can be that, you know, support for each other, I think that would be um, helpful in, in just kind of calming them down a little bit and giving them that space to kind of, you know, uh, retain their identity, but still synthesize it in a way that is doable for a North right. American system. Right. I see a question there from Maliha. Yeah. Maybe you can sure. see if you, if you can help. Yeah. So yeah. I, I run a mentoring program for refugee youth. Are there any tips mm -hmm. for mentors on how they can engage with youth who come from trauma backgrounds? Our mentors are not trained mental health professionals. They are community volunteers. Any advice would be helpful. So I think mentorship is actually a critical link uh, that we should provide more um, what's the word like give more weight to that model because you know i think it gives people a sense of um grounding and anchoring here uh, i would say you know whether it's art whether it's hobbies like sports um all of these hobbies can be tools that can um help to engage conversations and then ultimately build trust, um, whether it's working on homework together. I know, you know, a lot of the work that we're doing with the newcomer population, some of the young people are really struggling academically um, mm -hmm. and don't have a lot of formal education. And I think specifically for you know, non-trained mental health professionals, all of these tools can help to elevate someone's mental health, but in a non-clinical way. Uh, I think once they're able to kind of, you know, feel more confident doing that, that will help them feel like they can go to school and not, you know what I mean? Like be the odd person out, whether it's helping with literacy or digital literacy uh, or language tips, I think all of these sort of rudimentary um, skills will help you build your resiliency and your capacity to kind of like uh, socialize uh, and build networks together. Yeah, thank you. That's. Uh... These mentorship uh, programs go a long way. They um, really do. They, and they make um, a huge difference. So that's a great question, Maliha. Um, I see that Amanda has a great question uh, for us too to, to think about. And, and so the issue of, is of these youth, as you see, you know, who want to send money back to their home and families yeah. um, and not saving for themselves. Um, and, and as a result, you know, not being able to under, enter independent um, living in a, in a better way. So, you know, a suggestion on how to have these discussions or help them understand um, that they also need this support for themselves before they try to help, um, you know, their families um, back, back home. I think there, it, it just goes back to that guilt piece. I think there's mm -hmm. an immense amount of guilt for feeling like they survived. Yeah. Um, and speaking to a lot of the young men, sorry, they they really feel like, you know, if they could work 14 hours a day to build a better life, mm -hmm. um, that's just their um, tax for, for living here, you know? Um, but I think it'll take time to, yeah. right? To just kind of realize that you're, you were here for a reason, right? Like you yeah. were selected 
connected for a purpose. Uh, and while that purpose is helping your family, it's also having a good life, right? And building a life here. Yeah, I think that's a very good thing you just mentioned, Samaya, is the fact that, um, you know, the guilt of being here and them having a better life as opposed to what they feel their families are suffering from, you know, um, one thing to uh, let them know is it's, it's okay to have a good time. Yeah. It's okay yeah. to, it's okay to save for you. It's okay yeah, for sure. for to think of a brighter future for you, Absolutely. you know, because their families or their parents or whoever they left behind would want that for them. 100%. And uh, I, I remember having this conversation with one of the youths, you know, that I went out with and, and part of her guilt was, I, I don't feel like going out and, and buying something nice for me or, and, and I remember um, telling her that that's okay. Enjoy it. Because yes. wouldn't your mom and dad want you to, right? Yeah. So I had a conversation, uh, Amanda, you know, great question that you asked with her about this. And uh, she thought, yeah, yeah. If I tell my mom and dad about this, that I, you know, treated myself, they will be happy that I did this for me. Absolutely. So I, think, I think that's one way to get through to the youth that for their bright future, they've been sent here by them for that reason. Absolutely. And you want yeah. to constantly reassure, right? Yeah. And reframe the way they're thinking, maybe challenge some of those perspectives. Yeah. Sometimes it could be like a cognitive distortion, right? Where yeah. they are having a thinking error, but they don't realize that they're yeah. really kind of stuck um, in a thought process that's not productive. Right. Yeah. So it, it, it is. And also whatever they do for themselves um, has an impact on the future of what they might be able to do for their families. Right. So, 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 so Amanda, I would say, yeah, I mean, uh, the discussion could be what Samaya suggested and what I sort of went through with this particular youth is to say, it's okay, spend on yourselves and have a good time and, 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 and save for your independent skills so that you can make your family independence uh, down the line. So I'm seeing a great comment from Maliha in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. It's financial literacy has come up as one of the critical skills needed by refugee youth because I think they are thrust into independence so suddenly that they really haven't picked up those skills. Um, I think we're actually doing more sort of uh, like awareness campaigns around financial literacy because you even see adults really struggling with this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're sometimes we're expecting people to move from a place of scarcity to a place of security in a very rapid way. Um, and of course, people are going to make mistakes along the way but you know the the stakes are so high when we're talking about finances because you can make a few wrong decisions and you could really be suffering from those consequences for years to come uh i would recommend you know doing whether it's at your agency or at a community center doing like a six series, uh, like six sessions, um, where you're just kind of talking to them and equipping them with information around what are the consequences of bad decisions and what does budgeting look like? What does um, deferring your reward um, look like? And, and what are the benefits of um, not sort of going for that feeling of satisfaction of like paying for something that you can't afford long term right um and all of these things can be life skills that they take with them as they kind of further integrate into the larger community absolutely i had another question that i had um, someone had sent me for this particular workshop and we could maybe try to address that which is you know um as we know, I mean, you know, these are troubled youth and they come here deeply troubled. But the question um, a foster parent asked me um, is, what is, what is, what are the parameters of 
considering the trauma they faced, what are the parameters of acceptable and unacceptable behavior? And how can you work with those behaviors so that you know, it doesn't have an impact on, on them. And then you as a unit, when you're trying to help them, right? Yeah. So there are behaviors that you should be able to tell a trauma-faced youth, well, this is not right. And this is how to address it. Right. Yeah. I think, you know, like you guys all deserve an award for the work that you guys are doing. It is so, so remarkable. And um, honestly, like, I don't know if I could do what you guys do. It is like really life-changing. And I hope that you guys can, um, I don't think enough people thank you for the gap that you guys stand in. Um, I think the important pieces are to just be consistent, uh, to let them know that, your love for them is unconditional. Um, but then in terms of, you know, making sure that they feel safe and that they are brokers of safety for the people around them mm -hmm. is also so critical, right? Um, and it's, it's really going to be about setting boundaries in a way that doesn't like take their power away from the dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, because I think sometimes, you know, and, and it's about understanding why, why are you angry? Why do you feel like you need to act this way right now? Um, mm -hmm. What can we do to just kind of, you know, help you get through this feeling? Because this feeling is very temporary, right? It will pass, but let's just kind of take a moment. Uh, sometimes as the adult, you have to kind of walk away from the situation too. If you feel like everybody's uh, emotions are getting escalated, yeah. you want to model healthy behavior as well. Yeah, right, right. That, 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 that Those are great tips. And um, I'm sure that we could learn or, have coping mechanisms that we can instill, right? For, sure. for, for a certain behavior that may be out of place or uh, a reaction that's out of place. Um, one of the things to maybe teach our coping mechanisms. Yes, absolutely. Definitely. That would be more Tarek's domain. Yes. Uh, I'm yeah. trying to message him. Yes. Uh, he, I'm sure something he yeah, does come up with students at yes. the student center. So yeah. I have no doubt it's um, urgent that he's yeah. dealing with. Yeah, he was dealing with something um, that had come up. Um, so uh, thank you for all your patience with this. So if um, if Tariq Ahmed is not able to come on board, what we can do is have this discussion and maybe even have him, um, I can share his presentation that he was going to present today. Sure. Um, and, and we can obviously, uh, you know, um, listen to him and hear him later at another time as well. But yeah, Maliha, that's a great thing, you know. Uh, that you just said, yeah, it is so important that, you know, uh, role modeling healthy behaviors, um, you know, as caregivers um, and, and not experiencing the burnout that especially foster families experience and staff experience. It's, it's, it is such a daily thing, mm -hmm. right? It's such a daily thing for us too, as we address uh, these issues that come up and then you can have something pop up that you're not even um, aware could happen. So, to deal with it um, in an intelligent way that doesn't take away from, from them and from us. Because for many of these, especially foster parents, and um, you know, they have, we have family, we have our own children, we have their children that have now become our children. So it is, it is certainly very, very challenging. And the burnout I can see um, could be difficult. Uh, so- you know yeah. One thing I have heard mm -hmm. from families um, who have gone through some of this process is that they find a lot of positive affirmations mm -hmm. really work uh, right before bed. Mm -hmm. Things like, I love you. I'm so proud of you. Mm -hmm. You're enough. What can I do better? And not only does that help the child mm -hmm. when you're saying it, but when you wake up in the morning, mm -hmm. it also helps to reframe 
the relationship because sometimes, I mean, I have a 13 year old, there are challenges um, to the parenting process, right? And, and sometimes it can be very taxing, but when you kind of say these daily affirmations, you're also reminding yourself that like, you know, this is what I'm here for. And, and this is the reason I'm doing this, right? Yeah, I think those, I think you're right. That is a way to keep, keep yourself grounded, right? Too. Absolutely. So um, having this kind of discussion and affirming for them and for yourself that at the, at the end, what you're trying to do is, um, you know, help them and help yourself uh, and be there for them uh, and because you've taken out such great responsibility for them as well. So repeating that with them and going over that uh, will give them that reassurance as well. So, And actually a father mm-hmm. was uh, mentioning to me that he, he was sitting yes. with his son right before bed and he said, I'm so proud of you. And his son was like, proud of what like what specifically and he kind of like mumbled through it because it was the first time he had tried this exercise on the recommendation of his wife Mm -hmm. um but it really you know I think whether young people want to admit it or not they Mm -hmm. want to know that you're taking an interest in their life and that you're paying attention right and sometimes we as the adults don't do a good enough job of letting them know that we are invested, um, right? right? And not just financially, but emotionally, we want to see them succeed. Um, And right, like, it's important that they're winning these awards at schools and that um, they, they even showed up for school, right? Or that they took a test for example, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's a good point because I, I did have a foster parent share with me that one of her difficulties had been to have, you know, her youth go to school because yeah. there's been that, you know, hesitancy there because of the culture shock, obviously. Well, and I'll be, I mean, I we've heard of a lot of incidents of bullying as well, mm-hmm. whether it's around the clothing piece or the language piece um there's some violent incidents happening mm-hmm. at school mm-hmm. um and some of these kids it's the first these our schools are massive yeah. absolutely huge compared to what they've been accustomed to right so oh, yeah. that that can be very daunting and oftentimes the teachers and the staff um are not always safe spaces for them Um, so we can be advocates for our young people as well Mm -hmm. Um, and you know understand that sometimes it's going to take time right for them to feel safe in places so just showing up is the first step consistency is a big one I think at this stage as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And and that's kind of all we can really hope for until uh, they can allow themselves for better outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and turn to some of the school experts maybe to use how, how they deal with that. And so they have maybe some programs for the youth attending the school to give them a little bit more attention. As they enter and as they enter the school system um, for sure and um, i think making making these young people believe that you believe in them right is really right. the biggest uh like step forward that you can give them right yeah i can i can imagine because that, that's a great point you made that the school systems here would be so foreign to them coming from where they're coming from and how the classes were, how the sizes were, how the lessons were conducted. It is all such a, so new and so unique and uh, very, very different uh, from, from the school structure that they, you know, that they had. And I know um, one of the public school boards here Mm -hmm. had made arrangements with one of the local faith centers or mosques Mm -hmm. to provide free after-school tutoring Ah. to 
these certain populations because mm -hmm. we know tutoring costs lots of money. We mm -hmm. also know that there is a bit of a learning gap there that needs to be addressed for um, the learning to be buildable, right? Yes. So that is something that you can work on with your local community groups uh, and schools as well. Right. And I have to say for the number of people that are here online, we have such amazing um, agencies, uh, staff and foster parents with us today that that do so much to address all these, you know, unique things that come up that they find ways to help them. And that mm -hmm. is, I think is already something that is so remarkable for these youth that are with them and under their care that, you know, um, to find cultural items for them, to find cultural um, clothing for them. Um, and and that, that's hard. I'm sure when the youth wants to wear their traditional cultural clothing, um, many of you uh, go out and find that. And so I think that it's just beautiful that uh, that, that that keeps on going. <laughs> that you know so for so that for that youth to have that identity um you know intact that's also a great way so if you are facing this and i know some of you have faced this and you reach out to mfca or you reach out um you know to the staff contact so they can reach out to others to help you i think that is one way to um lessen the trauma i guess or lessen the what they're facing as um you know as they come over here and enter life here in the U.S. <laughs> so definitely. So if you're facing any other issues that maybe Samaya can help with, I feel that um, I, I believe that our uh, uh, guest today, um, Tariq Ahmed, may not be able to join us today, yeah. but certainly certainly we're going to ask him to share his presentation and, and perhaps bring him back when he can uh, join us. But these are such important questions that we talked about today. And if you have um, others that you'd like Samaya to address or um, that we can, you know, help with, um, let us know. Um, these are daunting stuff, <laughs> right? And, 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 and you've not been daunted. That's what's so impressive that um, all of you who are here today with MFCA and, and joining us in these workshops, um, you come here to bring your own expertise and to figure out tools um, that you, you know you can use to help and so we're, we're it's just wonderful to have you here you know figure out what are these tools and and I always feel there there are tools there always are I believe right isn't that where you run into Samaya that you feel that help is always possible absolutely it's just right uh, I think that's a Harry Potter quote right For yeah those who yeah are reaching out yeah, yeah, so, so important. So I think the capacity, the capacity for change is always possible. The capacity to embrace uh, is always possible. And I'm seeing that with our foster youth that they uh, sometimes are, they make lightning leaps to embrace and, and, and they are just so appreciative of all of you and um, in trying to help them. And I think they recognize that from my own work, from my end, I see it, how appreciative the youth are and um, how much you do to support them by uh, reaching out to um, MFCA, reaching out to uh, other organizations that are providing support. And I think uh, to continue to do that in our work is um, essential. Yeah, um, I was actually just in a conversation with someone last week and they were saying that there's a formula uh, for resilience. Uh, and that formula is P plus R equals S. And what that is, is pain, uh, because we all go through pain, it's part of the human condition, plus your resilience um, or sort of level of resilience is equal to your response to stress. Uh, and how you face stress or ad adversity. Uh, so what we can do in building these tools uh, and skills is to have a better ability to uh, increase resilience in our lives uh, and with our young people. 
Um, but it is a skill that is very much buildable. Uh, and we can't really determine how much pain we're going to kind of undergo or how much stress we're going to face in our life. But what we can control is our ability to react. Um, and we, the hope is that it would be with resilience and with gratitude. Um, so, you know, I'm sure you guys know of tons of tools and tips uh, to build gratitude and resilience, um, but we're always here. Um, feel free to reach out to our helpline as well. We have social workers and nurses who access our helpline um, just to kind of learn about how to support young people in their lives. Um, we also have the free web therapy if you feel like you're a young person. Actually, I apologize. I have to retract that. That's only for residents of Ontario right now, but we're hoping to establish a very similar model in uh, the US as well. And then we'd love to be able to do workshops on site as well. Uh, I know Shona and I have spoken about it uh, and hopefully we will be down uh, on your end of the border soon, but thank you guys so much for this opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Smaya. This is great. I think one of the things that we're all here for that is a tool in itself, I just thought of is knowledge. You know, mm -hmm. e equipping ourselves with, with knowledge is, is in itself a tool to uh, help each other and to help those under our care. Um, and, and, and I just uh, think that that's what we need. You know, I just ran into a quote as I was, uh, uh, you know, doing our work that we're all doing. And, and, and I thought I'd end with that, which is when we meet adversity with compassion and a desire to validate and heal rather than to judge or condemn, we manifest communities of care that empower people with self-knowledge and agency. So that is a powerful one. I was thinking about that. That that's it. When we're when we're feeling that compassion, uh, and all of us are so compassionate in the fields of what we're doing. I think when we are using that, we will we will help heal people. I think we will make that difference. I see that difference in everyone that all of you reach out to, and hopefully everyone that MFCA reaches out to. I feel that there is a it's a healing process and the healing process can sometimes takes time and so certainly I, I have to say kudos to you all for um, helping in that healing process and 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 helping MFCA do the important work that you're already doing and to um, help people uh, like Samaya in her field with Nasiha help others so thank you for uh, joining us today if you have any other questions or comments, let us know. Um, and we can go on from here. We can try to bring Tariq Ahmed, who is an expert back when he's available. I'm sorry, uh, apologies from all of us that he couldn't make it. But I think we had a beautiful discussion, though. And, and we're hopefully uh, able to help you all, um, you know, with some of the things you're facing. So thank you. Thank you, everybody for joining uh, MFCA. Thank you, Nasiha and Sumaya Puna for joining us and helping us with your expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day and week and enjoy that sunshine.
Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful week. And we hope to see you again next month.